do me a favor, go to the book of Ecclesiastes. No, don't go to Ecclesiastes. Go to the book of Romans. I'm going to quote Ecclesiastes. Um, I'll, I'll say what I need to say about that. But um, we're going to be walking through quite a bit of scripture this morning. But I want to begin here so we can hear what God is saying and what God is doing in our midst. Now, repeat after me while you're going to Romans. Say moment. moment. Say movement. movement. And say mission. Amen. My young, uh, my young Eddie blessed me, blessed the, blessed the socks off of me yesterday. He walked into my office while I was studying and he said to me, Dad, good word last week. And I'm like, you were listening? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I listen every Sunday. But he said to me, thanks for uh, refocusing me on my purpose. Wow. That was a blessing. That was a blessing to hear your kid come and say that to you. Say, just as that, thanks for refocusing me on my purpose I felt like I was getting distracted and wasn't sure on what I was supposed to do. And I find myself going all over the place. But I realized that my season began at birth. It's just a matter of timing. And where I am right now is in the timing of God. So that was just, that's exciting to hear. That's really exciting to hear him say that. So show Eddie some love, yeah. Yeah, he's, um, he's out of town and he's watching online. Um, him and his, they kind of went to visit their grandma, so lift them up in prayer. And Marcy is kind of running the tech stuff. So y'all show Marcia some love. Amen. Yeah. Marcia, yeah, she's, she's the big boss this morning. And Mark kind of said to me, I said, Mark, the boss is running. He said, she's always the boss, at least in my house. You know, <laughs> he's a smart man. Amen. So God is, is doing some great things and God is doing some phenomenal things. So we thank God for that. Let me um, begin the message here. Then we're going to walk through a couple of scriptures and I'll share some things for you. Here's what I said to you last week, just by way of quick review. In John chapter 5, verse 17, um, Jesus, quoted, um, Jesus quoted or written a saying, my father is always at work, and as a result, I too am always working. And I said it to you this way, Henry Blackaby took the same quote and said, our goal is to find out where God is working and to join him in what he is already doing in the earth realm. Don't, don't make the mistake of trying to create stuff and then try to invite God to come where we are. We go where God is and we work with him, Right? Because in the words of Rick Warren, if we want our church to be blessed and we want to experience growth, if our personal life to be blessed, we work where God is already blessing. Yeah, we don't create new stuff and then say, God, come over here and bless it. Come, are you guys getting that? Very, very important principle. I want us to understand that so we can hear what God is saying and what God is doing. So the whole place of finding out where God is is finding those God moments. The best illustration I can give you is those of you that were here Thursday night. Um, you witnessed a moment. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, you witnessed a moment. Does that make sense? I, I, want, I want to illustrate that really, really well. Because it's a moment where God was doing something by way of healing, uh, much needed healing in our community. Um, putting us uh, as, as peoples and nations and races together to be unified. And if we are wise in what God is doing, we can capitalize with the right people, the right systems, the right methodology, and end up with a good movement that can work with God to accomplish his mission in the earth world. Is that, that? Yeah, because it's not the heart of God that people be divided, that people be hurt, that all this crazy stuff go on, especially in the church of God. He wants us to come together and be all that he would have us to be. So I am just so blessed by that because I felt... God was doing something fresh. God was doing something new. And now it's up to us to seize the moment and work with God in the movement to be all that God would have us to be. Um, this illustration just, just, just begs to communicate it. Let me just say it. I think I understand now with the whole issue of racial reconciliation that even back in the early 60s or pre that um, when people were fighting for equal rights, MLK coming on the scene was the beginning of a season. So that makes sense? I want you all to hear me say that. Then along the continuum of the seasons, there were various times or various moments that people capitalized and turned them into movements to accomplish the mission of God. Thursday night was one such moment on the continuum. Does that make sense? Yeah, it was one such moment on the continuum. And the same is true for all of our lives. I want to kind of make this a little more personal before I go into what I'm going to share next week as it relates to um, this whole series that we're in. Uh, I want to, to kind of hit this thing home so we can hear what God is saying and what God is doing in our midst. So go to Romans chapter 4, and I'm going to begin there um, by reading. And while you're going there, 
Let me just quote Ecclesiastes chapter 3. It says, for everything there's a season and a time for every activity under the sun. Come on, say the everything. There's a season and a time for every activity under the sun. Amen. Now, if you're sitting next to a person, turn to that person real quick and say this. Say, you are no accident. <laughs> yeah. By virtue of the fact that I'm looking at you, your season has begun. It's a matter of aligning with the timing of God to so you can be in sync with what God is doing. I like that because I'm no accident. And you are no accident. You kind of get what I'm saying? And, and this is going to sound even so strange. Um, all the mistakes that you and I have made in life, even though they were out of whack and messed up and all that good stuff, man, God can work it out for his good. Does that make sense? God can work it out for his good. So look at what Romans said. And I want to just begin here to give you a little bit of feeling of um, who you are so we can kind of see ourselves now. I want to make seasons personal because next week, I'm going to go to your individual call, your individual ministry, your individual businesses, your individual whatever it is that God has created you to do. And if we haven't done it yet, I want us to understand um, this is going to be a precursor to what I'm going to say. Let me not give away next week. So pay attention to what I'm going to say. Okay, let me begin here. Let me just jump into, um, let's read 16. You guys are there? Now, this is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. This is speaking about Abraham. Not only to the inherent of the Lord, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. I mean, the ESV, who is the father of all of us. Look at verse 17. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed who gives life to the dead, and here's a phrase I want to really amplify, and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Verse 17 again. As it, is written, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Now, the reason I want to start there, because I want you to understand the, who is the subject of this passage that we're reading. Come on, say, this is God doing. Very, very important. I need to belabor this point because I want us to understand, um, if you have a King James or some other translation, um, you'll find that it probably says it's something like, um, calls, those, calls those things that be not as though they were. And a lot of us have heard that phrase from time to time, and we've heard it all over uh, Christendom, and we go around naming, claiming, proclaiming, whatever it is, and then we, we attach this to it. Well, Scripture says it, I'm calling those things that be not as though they are. Now, I need to clarify this because I need every person in here to know that you're not God. I need, I need us to be very, very clear about that. If you guys can bring this mic down a little bit, I'm talking really, really soft because I sense that it's loud. Um, say, I'm not, I'm not God. Okay. And I can't create like God. Very, very important for you to hear me, me say that. Yeah, you're not God and I'm not God and we cannot create like God. But here's what Romans is saying. God made a promise to Abraham. I'm laying some foundation here. And because God said it, even though it had not happened yet, it must happen because God said it. Okay. Not me, not you. Let's get the hermeneutic correct. Okay. Not us. Um, but God's word have created power because God said it. Is everybody clear with me on that? Are you guys hearing me? Very, very important that we not miss this. If God said it, it's going to happen. Okay, repeat after me. Say, if God says it, it's going to happen. Good. So now this is why it's important that I, I want us to understand that we must seize the moment such that when God is speaking, when God is releasing things into the atmospheric realm, we must be able to tap in with him and lock into what God is saying. Let me give you some illustrations or if brief illustrations and be patient with me. I've got to walk you to this. We're going to land with us of God speaking and things happening. Okay. Now pay close attention. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Go to Genesis chapter 1. And I said to you all this series for the next uh, week or two is going to sound conference style, and it has to be because I want us to hear 
and not miss what God is saying and what God is doing in our midst, okay? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Now, if you're there, say amen. Okay. If you're not there, say, wait on me, preacher. Nobody said it, so I mean, we must all be there. Okay, good. Now, watch this real carefully. Let me read. Notice what it says in Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Okay, let me explain verse 2. It says here in the beginning God did some created things, okay, but nothing had taken form, nothing had taken shape, nothing had been clearly defined. It was nothing but a big ball of chaos. Kind of looks like some of our lives, doesn't it? Oh, come on, say amen. Okay, and then look at the next phrase. And the Spirit of God, it says, was hovering over the face of the waters. I really, really like that phrase. God hovering, God waiting, God God endeavoring to do something, okay? And then look at verse 2. And then, I mean, verse 3. Verse 3 says, and God said, let there be light. And then look at what happened in the next phrase. And there was what? Now, here's a very, very important verse. Verse 4. This is going to make sense. And God saw the light... Uh, That the light was what? Okay, very, very important statement. Go down to verse 8. I mean, verse 6. Verse 6 says, here's another one of God vocalizing, God speaking. So God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the water. Let it separate the water from the waters. And verse 7 talks about what's going to happen. And it happened and all that good stuff. And then look at the last phrase of verse 7. It says, and it was what? So, now look at verse 9. Look at another instance of God speaking. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. Look at the next phrase. Now, what happened? Yeah. Okay, look at verse verse 11. And God said, let the earth do what? Sprout vegetation, plants, yielding seeds and fruits, bearing fruits in which there were seed, each one according to the kinds on its earth. I love the next phrase. Look at what happened. Yeah, look at verse 14. Look at verse 14. And God said, let the light in the expanse of the heavens, uh, let there be light in the expanse of the heaven to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years and on and on and on. And uh, look at the end of verse 18. And God saw that it was what? Good. Look at verse 20. One more time. And God said, let the water swarm um, uh, let the with swarms of living creatures, let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse. And guess what happened when God said it? Look at the bottom of verse 21. And he saw it was what? Good. Look at verse 24. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to its kind. And if God said it, look at the end of verse 24. Guess what happened? Y'all getting the point? Okay. And, and look at this, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after his likeness and let him give him dominion, all that good stuff, so on and so forth, so on and so forth, so on and so forth. And by virtue of the fact that I'm looking at you and you're looking at me, guess what happened? Yes. Now, you ever spoke something and it didn't happen? That's because you're not God. So, what we need to do now is to align with God So when we speak or when we do what God wants, you know, we can align to the it was so and it happens. Okay? Now, here I need to say this to go into the series, and I don't want you all to miss this. It's not about what I speak or what I say. It's all about what God says happening and me aligning to the timing of God. Because if God says it, guess what's going to happen? You guys are tracking with me? Does this make sense? So here is how he says it in Jeremiah uh, chapter 1. It says, before I formed you in the womb, I did what? I knew you and I ordained you. So please understand this. I said it this way last week. I am not here because Felix wants to be here. I had no say-so. I had no input. I had no anything into God allowing me to be here. The only reason I'm alive on the face of the earth today is because before I was formed in the womb, God knew me, and he had a purpose for me to be here. So my reason and my existence on the earth realm is not my desires, it's God's will. It's what God wants, not what I tell God I want to do. 
Oh, let's get that right. You guys are looking at me like deer in the headlight. Say, what in the world, preacher? I've been praying for this all day long. Since I get that. I get that. If our prayers align with the will and the desires of God, all is well. Okay? And, and then he kind of even says it this way in Jeremiah um, 29. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Does this make sense? Okay, so as creator, God knows what he wants us to do. He knows who he needs us to be. He knows who he created us to be on and 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 on. It's not about what I think I should do or what I would like to do, but it's all about what God wants me to do. Does this make sense? Turn your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, it's not about you. It's about God. Okay, very, very important. Let me, let me give you an example, and Wednesday we're going to really, really flesh this out. I'm going to give you two examples, and we don't have time to turn there. Well, Sunday, let's go there. Go to Exodus. Go to Exodus. Exodus chapter um, 1. Let me, let me illustrate it this way. Yeah, let me, ex- let me explain it this way. Okay. This is good. This, is, this will help you do some stuff. You guys are there? Okay. Go to verse 8 of Exodus chapter 1. Yeah. I'm going to give you this one example, then you can do the other one by yourself, and you'll be able to see where I'm going, and you're going to put our lives in this context. Say amen if you're at verse 8. Look how verse 8 picks up. There arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he said to the people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many, too mighty to come uh, for us, so come let us deal what? Shrewdly with them, lest they what? multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight us, so on and so forth, so on and so forth. And jump down to um, verse 11. Therefore they said, taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh's store cities, Python, Ramesses, verse 12. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the, uh, and the Egyptians were in fear or dread of the people of Israel. Look at verse 13. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and, and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar, bricks, and all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Now go over to uh, chapter, let me, let me do this real quick. Yeah, go over to chapter 2, and then I'll put it together. Okay? Now here's what you need to understand. Between verses 1 or verses 8 of Exodus chapter 1, and then verse 1 of chapter 2, here's what I need you to understand. About 400 years has transpired, approximately. Y'all like, whoa. About 400 years. Are you guys okay with that? Okay. So for a long time now, here's what I need you to know. The Israelites have been in slavery because a new king came on the scene who didn't know Joseph. And he subjected the people of God to, to, to slavery. So now notice what happens. Verse 1 says, they had this man, let me paraphrase, um, there was a man from the house of Levi. He went and took a, a wife, a Levite woman. Verse 2 said the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she did what? Hid him for three months, okay? I don't need to bore y'all with the details of the story. I just wanted to give you some feedback. All of a sudden, this child comes on the scene named Moses, okay? Now go over to chapter 3. Let me put this together for you real quick, okay? Um, go over to chapter 3. Let me show you this, okay? Okay. Um, you had, you had chapter 3? You had verse, go down to verse 7. This is going to make sense in a little while. You there? Look at verse 7. This is now God has called Moses 400 years later after his people have been in Israel. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are where? In Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their what? Taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of what? Egypt, and to bring them up of, out of a land to a land um, good with uh, a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to a place of the Canaanite, the Hittites, the Amorite, the Parasites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come up to me, and I have also seen the oppression which the Israelites oppressed them. So come now, he says, I will send you to who? 
to Pharaoh that you may go bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And look at verse 7. Now Moses is fighting. Moses is talking. Verse 11, all that good stuff. Let me put this together real quick. So here's the sequence I want you all to understand. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you. It's not about your will. It's not about my will. It's about God's plan. So here's what's happening. The Israelites make it to Exodus, okay? God leaves them in Exodus for over 400 years to go through what they need to go through. The Israelites have been praying all this time, God, bring us out, God, deliver us, God, all that stuff. Then finally, 400 years later, their prayers make it up to the ears of God. Now, here's what I want you to understand. The moment their prayers hit the ears of God, season began for Moses. Notice the next thing. All of a sudden, in response to the prayer of the people, God allows Moses to be born. Now, Moses came on the scene having no idea why he was in the earth. Well, I wish I had somebody in here. He, he had no framework that his existence was in response to the prayer of the people because of their situation. So watch Moses. He's hanging out in Pharaoh's house. As heir apparent to the throne, he's next in line. Come on, I'm going to be king of Egypt one day. And God said this to Moses. Whatever the circumstance or situation was, God hadn't even spoken to him yet. He allowed the worst nightmare in Moses' life to occur to force him out of Egypt so he can get him to a place where he can listen to God. Oh, you think, you think, you think your sin, your mess up, your worst nightmare is, 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 is a hiccup to God? No, 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 no. It's providence. Maybe God is pushing you to a place to listen to him. You wonder why we are more intensive in prayer in the worst times of our lives? Maybe that's a moment. <laughs> Where God is getting your attention. Does this make sense? The worst night, murder, wanted for murder. And in that sin, God calls him and says to him now, hey dude, you're created to deliver my people. And even though season began at birth, time was not till after God restored him. Everybody Okay. Okay, I can give you Jesus as an example. I can give you Paul as an example. I can go on and on and on and on with all the biblical characters. The reason they came on the scene was in response to something that God was doing in the earth realm. Wherever God was working, they partnered with God and they received the blessing of it. So you and I should be attentive to listening to the voice of God so he can direct us and tell us, hey, the reason I have you here, Patrick, is for this. Oh, come on, y'all. Come on, come on, come on. The reason I have you here, Robert, is for this. The reason I have you here, Sherman, is for this. Come on. The reason I have you here, Henry, is for this. We need to quit telling God why he has us here and start asking him more on the reason for our existence. Because it's about mission, and mission is not our desires, it's God's. Does this make sense, guys? Are you guys tracking with me? Okay. Now, let's get to our text because I want to walk you through some stuff to really um, lock into what I'm going to say. So go to Isaiah chapter 55. And we're going to hang out here for a little while. So come on, say the Spirit of God is hovering. We're going to come back to that. Isaiah 55. Go to Isaiah 55. And let me um, work here for a little while. I want you to see this. Then we're going to back into some things. Okay. This is all I came to share with you today, and I want you all to hear this piece. You there? Now, look at verse 10. Isaiah is speaking now prophetically, and he's explaining something about God. Then I'll back. Well, let me read verse 6, and I'll back up to verse 6. You guys are there? Verse 6 says, seek the Lord while he may be what? Call upon him while he is what? Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him do what? Return to the Lord that he may have what? Compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abend abundantly pardon him. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares what? 
Now, y'all look up at me before you read ahead. Now, here's context, literary context, which is very, very important. The Israelites were at a place of disobedience, straying away from God. And um, the prophet now is trying to encourage them to come back with God or come back to God so God could continue using them, so God could restore them, forgive them, and use them for the purpose for which he created them. Okay, so now within the context of a plea to return, a plea to come back, a plea to seek God, a plea to hear from God, just like we're doing this morning, come back, listen to God, hear to God, ask God why he has you here, don't do it on your own. Same context, same context, okay. So listen to the next phrase he says, watch what he says, he puts it this way, verse um, he says here in verse uh, 9, for as the heavens is high above the earth, so are my ways higher than ways, and your thoughts higher than my thoughts, look at verse 10 now, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but does what? Making it, I love that verb, making it, making it, making it, ah. <laughs> making it, bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Notice what he says. So is my what? Word that goes forth out of my what? Mouth. It shall not return to me. I like the King James word, empty, I mean void. Say void, say void. It shall not return to me empty or void. But look at the phrase. But it shall accomplish that which I purpose. And it shall succeed in what? The thing for what? Which I sent it. Now, look at verse 10. Let me read it again. I want to read this again because I want you all to get this, okay? Um, and and this, is not, this is not you. This is not me. This is why I had to go hermeneutically to Romans chapter 4 first because I don't want us to fool ourselves into thinking we've got, we're God because we've heard that enough and we're hurting people because they're releasing words into the atmospheric realm and it ain't working. Come on. And they're straying away from God and they're running from God because I want the, the theological premise to be established to their... Your words are not God's words. My words are not God's words, okay? So here's what the prophet says about God. As the rain and the snow come down from the heaven, and it do not return there, but waters the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, verse 11 says, so is the words or my word that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I said. Now, I need to work here for a little while. Say, when God releases a word, you only, I need to hear you. I know it's a few of us, but I still need to hear you. Say, when God releases a word, now go urban on me. Say, it got to happen. Yeah, come on, say it again. Say, it's got to happen. One more time. When God releases a word, it's got to happen. Now, in a culture that is predominantly agricultural, here is what the prophet Isaiah is saying to these people. Number one, he's saying the only reason you're able to eat, the only reason you're able to farm crop, the only reason you're able to have seed to put in the ground after you reap a harvest, the only reason the sustenance of your life exists is because of a principle that when God says something, it's got to happen. I want y'all to hear me. I want y'all to hear me say this. So here's what he says. Here's how God graciously blesses us. He releases rains from heaven, and he releases snow. Now, granted, in that context and in that culture, snow was probably not something that happened, if ever at all, but they can identify with rain. And they knew they had no control over rain because they probably remember the story of Elijah and Elisha. I wish I had somebody in here that no pagan deity could make it rain. Excuse the phrase, less than God does. It. I want y'all to hear me. So here's what the prophet says. Listen, this is what God said to the rain. When you leave here and you hit the earth realm, I am unauthorizing you to return unless. The ground must be fertilized. Seeds must germinate. People must be fed. Life must be sustained, and the economical uh, or ecological systems of the earth must function well before you can come back to me. That's an inanimate object, rain. Now, if he can talk to rain like that, <laughs> imagine, 
you and I who are made in what? The image and the likeness of God if the rain doesn't have a choice. I wish I had somebody in here. Do you think for one second that you and I have a choice that when God releases a word, we can violate the word? Eh, no, no, God, I'm going to do this. No, 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 no. He'll cause some stuff to happen in your life to redirect you simply because of the truth. He is God all by himself. Now, I need, I need to get just a little, a little cranial just for a moment. Now, y'all just repeat this. Um, say, imperfective aspect. Now, that's, that's the, grammar, the grammar that's nuanced in the verbal phrase, it shall not return. Let me explain. Let me explain. Very, very important concept as it relates to God. The imperfective aspect of the verb, and, and because Hebrew doesn't have tense, it kind of talks about kind of action, not time of action. Time of action is a Greek nuance. That's not something that happens in the Old Testament. The Old Testament just speaks about kind of action. So here's what it looks like. The imperfective aspects of the verb says that, that listen, the action will continue to happen until it returns to its source of origin. Don't worry. I'll explain. Because some of y'all are like, what? The action of the verb is ongoing uh, and it's, it's, it's in this incomplete stage um, until it returns to the point of origin. Let me illustrate. Where I'm from, we had these neighborhood grocery stores. And when we were out of milk, we didn't have King Supers. And kids didn't drive cars. So Mama and Dan would say, boy, why don't you go to the store to buy me some milk? So I'd say, okay, Mama, give me the money. Mama would give me the money, and I would head out to the store to buy the milk. Now, the moment I closed the door behind me, Mama would look out the window. Boy, don't you come back here. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah. That's the M. She was issuing an imperfective verb and saying, don't you come back here without the milk. Let me tell you what that means. Even though I went to the store, and I picked up the milk off the shelf, and I paid the attendant for the milk. The milk was not bought in mama's eyes until I got, yeah, y'all, y'all so smart. Y'all so smart, y'all so smart, because when I got home, then the action of the verbal phrase is completed because then in mama's eyes can she can say, the milk's bought. It wasn't about what I thought or what I think or what I did in the moment. The verb is not completed until the sender releases completion on it. So let me go here, let me go here, let me go here. So here's Genesis, and God says, let there be, and, 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 and then he says, until God said it was so, it wasn't done. I need two people just to say amen. Because here's the mistake we make on the continuum because we join the choir, we think it's done. Because we signed up for this, we think it's done. And God is trying to say, you're not done until I get you to destiny. Does this make sense? So here's what he says. He releases a word because before I formed you, I knew you and I ordained you to be. And so God says you're going to become. And the providence of God says he has us on this continuum, on this spiritual journey to get us to where we need to be. So here's how Paul says it. Paul says, I get this. I, I understand because life now is a maturation process. I am working, which is the operative term, participial form. I am working with God. I am doing with God. I am doing with God. I am not done till God calls me. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. So check this out. The word now, if I were to say, let me go back to my illustration. Mama, I don't know what happened, but I couldn't find the milk. Here's what mama going to say. Boy, you better go break them. Yeah. Go back. But mama, the neighborhood bully beat me up and took the milk money. Well, you better go learn how to fight. I don't know what neighborhood y'all from, but that's how my mama used to say it. Are you with me? Because I better not come home 
without, yeah, 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 yeah. Because I'm still in imperfective aspect mode, the verb is still happening until the milk returns, okay? Now, the reason I need you to understand that principle and that concept is because the reason you and I are still here today is because God is still working on us and the verb isn't done yet. Oh, you got to get this. You got to get this. The reason you survived the car accident is because the verb wasn't done yet. Come on, is this making sense? The reason the divorce couldn't take you out is because the verb, what? Wasn't done yet, yeah. The reason cancer couldn't kill you, the reason, you know, the overdose didn't take you out is because the verb, come on, I want you all to hear me, was not completed yet. It could not go back to God and say, God, I don't know what happened. She got sick and she died. So you must take me back. No, 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 no. You better go back and raise her. I wish I had somebody here from the dead because that word, if I release it, it cannot come back to me until it's completed. I don't know, but, but if I'm you and I'm sitting there right now, I am thanking God for the fact that his word, listen to what I'm going to say, is still hovering. And the spirit of God was hovering over the deep. So God's word is going to hang over you, and it's going to hang over me, and it does two things. It convicts and presses us to destiny, and it convicts us of the wrong so we can do who God would have us to do. I thank God for the hovering word that he released over my life. Because he's designed to call madness and to call, make, make sense out of chaos and to direct me into what he ultimately created and called me to be. So here's what I want you all to understand. Some of us have a sense of what our call and what our destiny is. It might not be the end, but you have an idea. And here's what you're doing. Sitting there as if God hadn't said nothing. I hope by now you understand Romans 4. When God says something, it's going to happen. And he has a way of calling those things that be not as though they were. Because you haven't made it yet doesn't mean that he hadn't said it. Because in the eyes of God, it's already completed. He's just waiting for us, lock into this now, to get to time so we can start doing now, here's what I want you to hear me say. Some of us are delaying time by our own actions. And God is crazy enough to back the sun up because of a word that he released. <laughs> y'all, y'all, y'all. <laughs> and to start time, oh, come on, y'all, all over again because of you. And because of me. Does this make sense? Because of a principle that he released. Just like that rain. You can't come back unless the earth germinates and, and seed is brought forth and plant sprouts. Because I'm going to send rain to do all that stuff. But, but if I release it, it's got to happen. You and I, here's what we're doing. Fighting with God, wrestling with God, telling God no. And here's the reason we say no, because of some foolishness that happened in the church. Or in our life, as if God is surprised by that. I wish I had time to work this out, because I'd want you to see the reason the thing happened. It wasn't so much about the people who did what they did to you. It's about what God wanted to take out of you that was not like him. <laughs> right? <laughs> Moses killed an Egyptian because he had some issues in him. God puts him in Midian for 40 long years to work out of Moses what was uncharacteristics of God such that when Moses goes back to Pharaoh and Pharaoh says no, Moses don't develop an attitude and hit Pharaoh with the rod. <laughs> as humorous as that may seem, a lot of us are beating the people of God 
with rods because God hasn't finished the work in us. Y'all tracking with me? <laughs> tracking with me? So, so here's the thing, as, 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 as crazy as this may seem, at the end of the day, we are going to do what God is calling us to do. So I get divine providence. I get all that stuff. I'm the person that's going to say to you, seize the moment. Here's how scripture says it. Um, when you hear the voice of God, harden not your what? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I all the time look at my life and I said, man, I could have been further along had I been obedient sooner. I get it. I get it. Now I'm looking back at seasons and I can count the moments that I missed. So I'm at a place in my life right now, I'm looking for moments. And I'm not going to miss them no more. And here's what I said to you. To, amen, amen. Here's what I said to you the first day of the series when we started last week. I said to you, my framework now is that vision has taken a long time to go. I get time and I get all that stuff of God. But a lot of the moments that were missed is because of us, because of me missing what God was saying, hitting folk with Pharaoh's rod, with, with Moses' rod, doing all that crazy stuff. But when God continues or finishes a work in you, your framework is completely different. So I know God has released the word. I think you know God has released the word. And so the challenge now is to get us to the place of seizing the moment because it must return. It can't go back to him saying, well, God, Rashid was in a car accident. And you, you didn't see that one coming. Not the God that I serve. <laughs> Are you with me? Nothing we go through is accidental or incidental with God. Does this make sense? Nothing we go through is accidental or incidental with God. Here's how I said it last week. Ask God what he's doing in the moment. Ask God what he's doing in the moment. Ask God what he's doing in the moment. If you were here on Wednesday night, here's what I said on Wednesday night. I might have said it last and I don't remember now, but imagine... While Joseph was going through the pit, we were like, man, that's, that's got to be so hard. It's got to be so painful. That is so mean. Then he ends up in Pharaoh Potiphar's house and he ends up in jail again. That's got to be painful. That is so harsh. That is so mean. But when he got to the throne, here's how our phrases change. What a blessing. <laughs> what a blessing. And so, and so we want to go from daddy's house straight to the throne we want to avoid the pits and the dungeons. It's all part of the process. All part of the process. So listen to what I'm going to say. If you've been hiding in Midian, come out of hiding. Divine Providence says you're hearing this word in this season because your time is at hand. I want you to hear me say that. I understand, I'm learning to understand God theologically like this. When God releases a word, not, I'm not saying Felix is saying, I'm not saying Felix's word has created power. I'm not saying none of that kind of stuff. God structures it such that if in this season you're hearing what you're saying, what's being said, it's no different than him coming to Moses at the burning bush and saying, go to Pharaoh. And tell them, let my people go. Time to come out of hiding. Y'all all right? Let's back into this, then we're going to stop. Go to verse, go to verse 8. So here's how the prophet concludes it. You there? My thoughts are not your want. My ways are not your want. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Then look at what he says in verse 6. As a result of all of that, seek God while he may be what? Call upon him while he is what? Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man or person their thoughts and let them return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon him. Verse 6, seek the Lord 
while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. Scripture puts it this way in the New Testament. Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. This is going to sound hard. Don't leave here saying, let me go think about it. Because after you've thought about it and you come back, you might come here. God might be over here. So, while the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you, harden not your heart. So here's what this looks like. If you're here and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, now is the accepted time. If you know there's been a gift and calling on your life that God's been trying to get your attention, now is the time to say, yes, Lord. What it looks like is not my business, it's not your business. You kind of get what I'm saying? The response is the beginning of working with God. He does it from there however he wants to do it. But by virtue of the fact that you're hearing what he's saying, he's saying, my word has been released, now it's time to respond. So if I'm you and I don't know God, even though I don't understand what salvation is, but I know I'm not saved, I'm saying, sign me up. I'm saying, sign me up. Are you hearing me? Then if I know God is calling me into something, I don't know what it is. I'm saying, sign me up. We'll flesh it out later. Does that, does that make sense? Th that's what I want you all to hear me saying. Uh, this is not about church membership. This is not about none of that stuff. It's about this, you and God. Saying, God, let's begin the process of me hearing from you clearly. Because now everything has been put into perspective on why I'm here. Bow your heads with me. The worship team, come. Holy Spirit, be God in our midst. Holy Spirit, move in this place. Holy Spirit, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for how you're moving. Thank you for how you're working in our midst, God. Next week, you're going to show us something different in your word that's in line with all of this. But today is foundational for us to receive the principles that you're going to share with us next week. So my prayer, if there's one here that has not said yes to you, that don't know you as Lord and Savior, bring him, Lord. If there's one that's been hiding in Midian, bring him or her forward, God. If there's one that's been hurt bad, be it from a bad relationship, a work experience, a church experience, whatever it is, God, let them see you are preparing them for a time as this, Lord, and draw them, draw them. We're not saying the hurt was not real. We're not saying the encounter was not real. We're not saying any of that. But God, you working it out for your good. You're working it out for your good. And none of us here are here accidentally or incidentally. It's the purposes of God. And as crazy as the weather has been, Lord, and some are not able to make it, some are watching online, even if they're watching online, I'm praying, God, that the same appeal would go out in front of that television or in front of that computer screen. A person would say yes. And so, God, we give it to you. We hear the sound of revival, God. So move in our midst, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.